Well, thank you so much for having me. That was a nice introduction. So um, I think we'll kick it off. So today uh, we wanted to have this lecture. This is a topic that people love to talk about. You, not everybody gets to see patients like this um, and take care of them. So it's really cool to have a talk like this. I see a fair number of these that become more of a referral source over the last, even the last year or two. Uh, and so we probably do, we're doing one on Thursday. We do probably one every week or two in terms of the transplants and then a mix of the combination. So this will be good for everybody. And then the biologics we'll just touch on briefly. All right, and so the biggest thing is really what's the hype? You know, you've heard about it. You may never have seen somebody, you may have. So why is it a big deal? Perfect, so uh, these are my disclosures. And this is special thanks to this guy, Dr. Brian Cole. And this is who I trained me at Rush. Uh, he's probably the best meniscus cartilage surgeon in the world. Happened to be fortunate to work with him for a year in Chicago, and he also does biologics. So I basically mimicked my practice off of his, plus a few other things that I do that are different. So here's the objectives of the talk. So we're gonna review biologics very briefly. We're gonna do indications for different cartilage procedures. We're gonna review cartilage transplant, and we're gonna review meniscus transplant. I will do my best to go slow, but this is a very complicated, very big topic. And so I'll try to give you guys as much information and hopefully with, I got the recording, I'll send it out. Um, and hopefully if you, I can send you guys the PowerPoint, you guys can look through it again to kind of recap if you want uh, to learn more, okay? So here's the landscape we are in 2021 for orthobiologics. So you have these things called cytokines uh, and orthokines. People sometimes go to Germany for this. What Kobe Bryant had, A-Rod had this. This is a pretty expensive option, but it's an option that does exist and it, and it requires a number of different injections. Then the one I use the most, which is PRP. And you have the two types, the leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor. Uh, and we'll go into those another time, um, but just to mention them. And then you have the stem cells. And this is the one people love to talk about. It's one of the number one hits on the search uh, on Google. So you have autologous, those are ones from marrow, adipose. There are a number of other ones coming down the line. So you can get them from your shoulder, from the synovial fluid, those type of things. And then you have allogeneic, which is from uh, adipose tissue, um, marrow, or the one people usually have is um, from uh, amniotic fluid. So orthobiologics are substances found naturally in your body and they help you heal more efficiently. So there's such as bone grafts, autologous blood, then you have these artificial matrix materials, and then they have growth factors such as PRP, then you have BMPs and these stem cells that are sort of mesochymal versus progenitor. So here's what's marketed to surgeons. And so it's important for you to know this because these are all the different products that are marketed to surgeons. And this is a couple year old article, but I thought it was good because it listed this. And the ones in red are the ones I do the most of. And as you can see, they have the most data on them. The other ones are more stem cell related uh, and there's a little less data but it's just something that you're, you can see what products have a lot of data and what products have very few data. So it's important to know that when your patients are asking for things. And as PTs, you guys get probably more of this than I do because I get a lot of referrals from you, people who wanna ask questions about this. So biggest thing here is how can we take a surgery? So this is a person with an OCD, a young patient, a cartilage transplant, so cartilage from another, from a patient just recently passed away and bone marrow soak it in there and how can we get a transplant to look like that on the right? And this is what we see more frequently. Now, we're not always scoping somebody with this to find out later on, but this is the product that we wanna get every time. So PRP, so this is PRP options. There's three main options. There's a PRP leukocyte pore. That tends to be something we use in people with arthritis. This is just very brief. Pure PRP, I, even a six months ago, I told you, you know, we just basically toss it out. We don't use PRP pure. There's an article that came out about rotator cuffs, so maybe that will help re -tear rates. And then there's leukocyte rich, which we use a lot for tendinopathies, so epicondylitis, patellar tendinitis, quad tendinitis. And I do a mix of both of these. It kind of depends on the patient, and we titrate it based off that. So why does it matter? What types of people are PRP, and how do they work? Well, very briefly, there's different inflammatory and anti-inflammatory factors in these. So if you see here in red, that is the leukocyte rich PRP. It has a lot of inflammatory markers. So people who get a rich one have a lot of inflammation. You've heard of people get PRP injection. If they get a rich one, it tends to be more painful for a while. Say it can be a couple of weeks or so. And that's the one that helps heal an injured tendon. Then there's the P leukocyte poor. So that's the LP one. And that's the one that has more anti-inflammatory markers. So that's the one you wanna decrease the inflammation inside of somebody. So that's the one where you put that in someone's knee with arthritis. This is the most common one we use because arthritis is one of the most common treatments I use PRP for. 
So that's a very brief uh, topic on that. And let's get to the fun stuff too. So cartilage preservation, what does it take? You have to be patient. You need to be okay without perfect. Okay, so everyone always wants to hear about meniscus cartilage transplants, but they have to understand that these are not 100% success surgeries. Some of these surgeries have a 70, 80% success, 30% complication rate. Now complication is not a dramatic failure, but it's something you need to understand. And we'll talk about that later. Most patients come in with more than one surgery. So these aren't straight off the street. Someone's like, I need a cartilage transplant, can you fix me? I, I luckily get more of those now than I used to, but that's not the common thing. Usually they come in three, four, five failed surgeries and you gotta be able to man up, go through their whole record, understand all that stuff, and then figure out how you're gonna treat them. You need to look outside the box. Do they need revision of their ligaments? Is the cartilage lesion causing the pain or is that not the problem? There are so many examples I have in my practice of things that patient had a cartilage defect that wasn't even the problem or had other things going on. For example, in this x-ray, this patient needs to be realigned because they have too much varus in their knees. And that's x from my practice. So what is needed? Well, you need to have support. I have a coordinator that deals with all of this transplant stuff. And patients are put on the list. They wait for matches. For cartilage transplants, you have 28 days to implant it once they give me the okay, the transplant's ready to go. Meniscus transplants, six months. Sometimes you can wait a little longer. Thankfully, those can be scheduled. The transplants are a little bit more, the cartilage ones are a little more different but you have to be comfortable with a lot of other surgeries. You can't say, I wanna be a cartilage guy and not know how to do all of these. So ACL, revision ACL, high tibial osteotomy, meniscus transplants, the list goes on. I'm not gonna overdo it on this. You can see here, you can look back later on this lecture, but this is a really good summary slide um, from arthroscopy about different size lesions and how we treat them and what we have to do to address everything else. So if it's an alignment issue, we have to recorrect the bone. If there's a meniscus issue, we have to recorrect the meniscus. And if there's a ligament issue, we reconnect the ligament. The problem is some patients have all of those and that's a huge surgery. So you just have to be careful on how much surgery you do for patients. And sometimes you have to do it in a stage fashion. Well, okay, I just told you about all these fun surgeries we do. Well, you don't treat every lesion. So there are a number of articles that show that certain lesions don't need to be treated or we can watch certain lesions. And we'll get into which ones we do and which ones we don't. So this is the number one problem I see with surgeons that are not well-trained in cartilage. And it happens very frequently. I see a ton of these. So this is an article, 644 patients, they had ACL tears with a defect found on MRI. Two-year follow-up, 129 were debrided, 164 were microfractured. The microfracture work group had significantly worse scores, pain and coup scores versus the ones that just had cleanup. So the biggest thing here is if you find a defect and it doesn't hurt, or even if you think it might be a problem, you leave it alone, you do their ACL and see how they do, okay? Now I've had patients I've done a combo with, but those, and I don't do a microfracture, I do a cartilage transplant, but those patients have a lot of pain there. Most patients with these defects, you just leave them alone. And a lot of times they never come back and see you and they never need it. So we leave it alone. We do not microfracture. You're going to hear that throughout the entire course of this lecture. So what do we do? What, um, so who do we treat then? So symptoms, symptoms, symptoms. Remember, they're subtle. So you might see a lot of times the PTs may see them swelling, pain, locking, catching. As soon as they start having those symptoms, then I jump on the boat and intervene. But if they don't have symptoms, a lot of times they won't do anything. Damage secondary to meniscus or tibia. You wanna catch it before this happens. The problem is that sometimes it's too late. So it's kind of like you gotta figure out the, the balance. Again, a lot of patients are coming to my office with asymptomatic cartilage defects, but it do, does happen. So it's important for you guys to know that patients with no symptoms don't always need surgery. I'm if you find someone with a defect and they have no symptoms, still send them my way so I can evaluate them because sometimes they don't know. Like they'll be like, oh, I'm fine. And really they're not doing that well. And then you want to intervene at the tin point because this is a patient of mine that needed a meniscus and a cartilage transplant. It's actually a physical therapist in the area. And you can see that's not a good picture. So why ever intervene? Well, cartilage repair surgery does prevent progression of the knee arthritis. So there's certain patients, as soon as they're having problems, you want to intervene. 32 patients, cartilage defects. Half had cartilage treatment, half had non-operative treatment. Obviously, mean defect here is 1.4 centimeters. So anything above one starts to become symptomatic. Um, Follow-up was six years. The non-operative group had significantly worse functional scores and more severe OA at six-year follow-up. That's not that much. These patients are like 20 and 30 years old, so that's not good. Conclusion, patients with cartilage repair show less progression of OA to non-operative patients with identical cartilage defects. So that's something to remember. Once they become symptomatic, they should be treated. Okay, 
The problem you have is a lot of guys in the city don't know how to do the cartilage issue, the cartilage um, procedures. And so a lot of people just get tons of microfracture. I had one guy that had four microfracture procedures to the exact same spot, 22 years old, not good. So my algorithm, and again, this is our really gross pictures. And there'll be some more stuff like this. So if you don't like them, just close your eyes for a minute and then we'll move on. Uh, in season athlete debridement, it's the best thing to do. Like let's say they have a big, big burst of cartilage, you clean them up. And then at the end of the season, you decide what to do. Microfracture again, I bring this up here, I almost never use it. These def defects are rarely small. Even though they seem small in MRI, they're usually much bigger when you go in there. Biocartilage, de novo, we'll go into that briefly, but that's for smaller defects. So that's sort of like microfracture plus, and I will do those sometimes. Cartilage tra um, transplants or oats from other parts of the knee is something that we do sometimes. And then really the bulk of what I do in my practice is Macy and uh, cartilage transplants. So there's a lot to think about. So how does this, again, what do you think about when I, when I see this patient? How does this all relate? I need to get a good physical exam, history, MRI, alignment films. Everything has to happen at once. We get all that stuff done. If I see them for the first time, they have to have all this done before the second visit. And that's when we go over really what needs, needs to happen. I have to customize each treatment. Each patient is different. Sometimes they can't handle four procedures at once. So I say, let's do this in a stage fashion or which hurts the most. So I'll take care of that first. Be aware of all these things to get better results. If you do not do all the things properly, you will not get the result that you want. So what's the issue? Most surgeons don't review all why. Training, it's very, there's not that many places that do this routinely. And so you need to have the training in the beginning. It's really time consuming. This patient, a patient like this, a 22 year old with four failed surgeries is not a 15 minute visit. It's a 30, 35, 40 minute visit. And in a physio orthopedic surgeon's practice, that's very challenging. Many of these problems require more than one surgery. So you have to discuss them. This is a staged thing. Low volume. These are not common. For most people, most surgeons, they see one of these every six months. If they even know what they're looking at, if it obviously comes in and tells them, you know, I need a transplant, et cetera. But if you're not a referral source for these and there's not that many people that do them, you don't see them that often. So you don't know exactly the right algorithm. And again, remember the more previous surgeries, the worse the outcome. So obviously I want to intervene early if it's, if it's got more surgeries, I deal with it, but that's something you guys should know. Especially when patients are saying, well, I got offered a transplant. It seems that's a really big surgery. Maybe I should go with the smaller one. It's important to know that information. So we gotta evaluate again. I'm gonna keep hammering this down. We have to evaluate everything. This Venn diagram on the right, instability, alignment, meniscal deficiency, articular issues. So those are the main things we look for. So what are the spectrum of treatments? So you have here, debridement on the right, followed by microfracture, de novo, which is sort of cartilage, uh, baby cartilage chips uh, we use, and cartiform, and you have cartilage transplant oats, and then Macy and OIG. You can see the numbers of those procedures done drop off significantly because that's when you get more complicated. It requires more skill set, specialized skill set, and you have to have certain things in your practice that are set up to do this. Our, a surgeon without a coordinator for transplants cannot just start doing transplants, or having the Macy requires a two-step procedure, so you can't just all of a sudden go into doing it. So again, I talk about a lot of fancy procedures, but again, debridement works sometimes. So it's important to understand that the first step I always is debridement. So you evaluate the lesion, you wanna make sure you go in there and do a cleanup. A diagnostic scope is essential. These lesions are almost always bigger than you think. I would tell you the last time that I saw a lesion that was one centimeter and I went in there and cleaned it up and it was one centimeter, probably about the last three years or four years of doing this in practice, I probably had one that was, left, that was unchanged. They're always bigger. Sometimes debridement alone can treat the symptoms and you don't need to microfracture the defects. They do really well if you just debride them focally. So here's a paper on this. So 52 athletes, James Andrews, this is the guy that used to see every single NFL and MLB player, always first, second or third opinion would come to him. Average follow-up 5.9 years, no correlation outcomes with age, lesion size, location, draft pick. But the correlation was microfractured. If they micro, someone microfractured a small cartilage defect in an NFL player, they were 4.4 times less likely to return to play. That's crazy. That means literally a lesser procedure, which is a chondroplasty, you just clean the rim, does much better. Now it's not perfect, but 70% return to NFL. This is the highest level possible at 8.2 months. This is Macy results. Again, we're gonna go in this briefly. This is mostly a cartilage talk. Um, so you can see here, ACI or Macy, um, much better results in microfracture. Micro, the, AC, the ACI at 12 months versus microfracture at seven months. So a little slower return um, again, but microfracture deteriorated significantly at two years. So really 
And you'll find out that microfracture actually damages your, your ability to do a Macy later. So it's important to understand all this stuff. And then 73% return to sport. And these are higher level athletes. So again, I told you like, this is not hundred percent return, but these are also really big problems. So if we can get somebody back, we can get seven out of 10 people back to sport that normally would never been able to do that. That's pretty cool. So here's Macy. This is a very challenging patient population. This is the patient population that I take care of a fair amount. Patella, young girls, 20, 30, big defects with a bunch of other stuff in their knee. This is, this is using Macy, nine-year follow-up, 58 patients. Almost all these need a TTO, so they need an osteotomy to realign them, and they also add the cartilage, and I do this frequently. Um, average age, 36 years old. So these are not older patients. I mean, 36 years old, is, that's the young patient population, and they're really disabled. 88% satisfaction rate. That's really impressive. No microfracture, 91% success at five and 10 years. If someone microfractured them before, it's 43% success. That is really not good. It's not worth it. It really isn't to do a microfracture first. Overall, you can see the survival here. And that's obviously mixing in the two groups. So patellofemoral patients, there's three main types and we're not gonna do too much of this. There's ones with a direct trauma, they get a defect. There's the ones I see most frequently, which are women and men, but mostly women that dislocate their kneecaps. And then there's alignment issues uh, that cause overload. So they're way too far over one way and they kind of override the thing. You may need a TTO to paint on the pathology and alignment. And this is sort of a chart. Again, that's the same, same uh, journal area, but different alignment. I use this almost every time before a case. I kind of look at this and say, here are my numbers. Here's the data I can give people. So autologous transplant, this is from your own knee. I don't do too many of these. Again, I don't like, they always say there's no big deal. It's you just take from part of the knee that doesn't have any weight bearing surfaces. I've seen a number of patients that have had these done that have a lot of problems from the trochlea where they got it taken because it's either not done right or they do it. They're too afraid to take a smaller, a smaller area and they go right in the middle. So it's just the cartilage transplants now, the ones off the shelf or the ones that we get, uh, which you'll see in a second, they have really good success. But here again, comparing a microfracture, 96% versus 52%. So what, what's a, what's cartilage transplant? So someone passes away within 24 hours of asystole. It's aseptic processing, PCR testing, bacterial testing. They test for literally everything. They now actually test for COVID uh, in these. Prolonged fresh. So these are fresh. You can see the two bottom. One is the one I use. This is an ankle bone I use for a shoulder sometimes, uh, which we don't want time to go into, but that's a cool procedure. Um, and uh, you can see here the little graph. 28 days is when the cells are like sort of, that's the safest. Less than 28 days is ideal. Uh, to put these in and uh, they have to be fresh. So what do we do? So I used to do x-rays, now I do MRIs. Um, we match the contour. So that's a picture I get from the company and they show me the graph size, the maximum size I can get from that graph. And then that's what comes in the little, little solution that I use, you'll see in a second. So again, diagnostic scope, I always scope patients unless they've had a uh, scope from a partner or myself in the, within the last year. Um, MRI, operative notes, clinic notes, look at all that stuff, submit that submit to insurance or graft approval. And then once they give the approval, then we look for a match. And then we have 28 days. And this is all the numbers that I get that I have to approve as well as my coordinator has to review. So I won't gross everybody too much out, but this is obviously a full surgery. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but I'll give you them. This is my surgery. This is a surgery with a meniscus transplant and a cartilage transplant mix in. Um, but it was a case that I wanted to make sure that we had for uh, a lecture. So you can see here we're doing arthrotomy. We're opening the knee. Now this had to be a bigger incision because there's a meniscus transplant in here too. You can see we match up where that cartilage, this is an OCD. So the patient had an OCD that destroyed their meniscus, didn't get treatment. This patient is in their twenties. So this is not, this is not an ideal situation. Um, and then you can see here, we core out the area where, the, where we want to get new cartilage in. And then here is the transplant. So here is the fresh graft and I'm going to match the contour of the patient's anatomy with this. And I know because of the way I can see the angle of the anatomy, and this is the hardest part, because obviously you, only, you can see, you don't have much space for a second graft here. You can do it if there's a problem, but overall you really have to be. And then you wanna make sure you cut the graft up, make sure you don't drop it, that's a big deal. And then I'm gonna measure the depth. So if someone's measured the depth and my PAs are measuring the depth on the patient and I'm trying to match it up. This is just like woodworking, except it's somebody's body. And so then you're gonna see here, we're gonna kind of align it. I'm gonna move through a little quicker. We're gonna clean the side so this will go in nicely. And 
You can see we have the defect all set up. There's been holes drilled in there. We use PRP and we soak it in that. And then it's gonna be like, oh, we're just gonna hope this goes in. So then that's the biggest thing. This is when we're all crossing our fingers. Now you don't want to smash this thing in, you'll damage the cartilage. So you're very gently tapping and it press fits. So there's no screws, nothing, look at that. And then you completely regenerate the cartilage. So that's just an example of what I did. Um, so results, 43 patients, 74% recreational athletes, 23% college, these no osteotomies in here, 58% uh, had prior surgery, 88% return to play, average return is 9.6 months. If they're greater than 25 or more than a year of symptoms, they didn't do as well, but they still had good results. Another return to sport, 149 knees. That's a lot of patients. This is 45% highly competitive, 55% well-trained, six-year follow-up, 75% return to play. That's pretty cool. These are big cartilage defects. Patients, in most cases, aren't able to do anything beforehand. 91% satisfaction. The biggest thing people ask is survival. So survival rate is 91% at five years, 89% at 10 years. I'll give you some other numbers too. You can see here, this is where I told you about 30% complications. 30% complications are mostly debridement. So when someone has a failure of their cartilage, it's not the whole thing. They have a little tiny fleck of cartilage that tears off and then you have to go in there and clean it. So it's not, a, it's not as bad. It's the full failure is usually 9% or 10%. Uh, 13 athletes, these are high level athletes. This is from Cole where I train. Five, five to six years, 70% return to sport. Most of them didn't return because they graduated. And you can say biggest thing is a lot of my patients are not that they can't return, they're afraid because obviously they went through this huge surgery and they don't want to get back to the highest level stuff. But a lot of patients are able to like this, get running, but they don't want to go back to playing like competitive soccer. So here is my one I quote people on. I like this one because it's sort of a mix of all these different studies. And you can see what, why people do transplants. Usually, you know, post-traumatic, OCD, AVN, and idiopathic. Yeah, I got a mix in the last month of all four of these, which has been pretty fun uh, to take care of. At mean age is 37. So these are not, you know, these are not 56 year olds you're doing this on. 91% five years survive, five years, 91% survival, 76% at 10 to 15 years. I usually say 10 to 15 years, 70 or 6%. So this again, return to sport, 44 studies. This is a bunch of studies. This is all those cartilage things I told you about. Osteochondral allograft transplants, that's fresh cartilage, usually smaller defects, 93%. Cartilage transplant, 88%. Macy, 82%. Now, here's the quick, here's the thing. Usually, people aren't doing transplants for the patella. They are sometimes, but now we've been doing more Macy's. And so you have to take that into account. So um, 82% for a patella is very impressive. And microfracture, you can see, not good, 58%. You faster, you know, in similar return. So you're going to microfracture somebody and tell them it takes 9.1. Most surgeons will not tell you it takes 9.1 months to get back after a microfracture. They'll tell you you can just walk out of the surgery center and you're fine. Not, not true, not a good idea. And it's an inappropriate management of doing that. So this is more defects for femoral condyles. Again, most of these are femoral condyles. 160 patients, 39.4% reoperation rate. So it's not that this is a simple surgery. You're never going to see these patients. These are your patients for life. Survivor rate, and these are young patients. So you're, you know, they're gonna probably, they might not live, their transplant, you're gonna see them at least once or twice before the end of your career if you do them when you're young. 86% uh, survival at five years, 81 at 10 years. The biggest predictors of failure were longer symptoms. You can keep hearing, the longer you wait with symptoms, the more likely chance you are to do poorly. And that's because other things get damaged. Number of previous surgeries and obviously BMI. So BMI above 35, I will not do the surgery on the patient. 31 uh, knees. Uh, this is again, can you do them with ACLs? Like I told you before, you can if you do it with the pro proper patient. I've done a fair number of these and it, it, they do really well. 31 knees with ACL and transplant versus 62% of patients, 62 patients with isolated transplants. The failure rates make 9.7% and survival rates are identical. If in appropriate patient, you realign there, you give them good, uh, you give them good um, uh, ligaments and you do a cartilage transplant at the same time, they just as well as a regular transplant patient. So this is the biggest thing. You wanna make sure you do everything that's wrong with the patient at the time. Here are some things we have, some failures that can happen and how we fix them. I don't wanna run out of time, so I wanna keep going on this. So now we get to the meniscus transplant. So what is it? It's a way to slow down arthritic changes in patients with meniscal deficiency. It is not a way to fix arthritis when people already have it. And that is a thing that I get a lot. I get a lot of 50 and 60 year olds coming in from all over the place to my office being like, can you transplant a meniscus? And unfortunately in a lot of patients, it's too late. It's more of a scaffold. 
Okay, so this is not a brand new meniscus so you can go back to doing everything you want to do and you're going to be perfectly fine. Indications, so previous meniscectomy, it's important to know this, greater than 50%. You don't have to have no meniscus left to have this done. There's a lot of people I've transplanted that are in the 30, 40% meniscus uh, remaining that are doing very poorly and then they have to get a transplant done. There's patients with pain and discomfort associated with meniscal deficiency. They have to have the pain and discomfort. This is a big one. And undergoing ACL reconstruction for increased stability. So I have a lot of patients I've done a meniscus transplant and an ACL at the same time. That's those data. The data shows they do really, really well because if you don't get rid, add their new meniscus, you don't add their secondary stabilizer back. Plus it saves your ACL if you do it properly. And then athletes to reduce the risk of arthritis. This is sort of a, an off the label indication, but that's one thing to think about. Um, and again, biomechanically absent with pain and swelling. So I always ask them if they have no pain on that side and they're missing a meniscus, I'm not touching them. I'm going to wait till they start having symptoms and then I take care of them. This is not a pre symptom procedure in, for the most part. So corrected or correctable comorbidities, BMI less than 35, alignment that can be corrected, ligaments that can be corrected, and cartilage that can be corrected. If you can correct these things, these don't count as comorbidities. But here's the last one, expectations. I had a patient came to my office, they wanted a meniscus transplant, they wanted to go back to high level CrossFit, and they told me they weren't gonna be happy unless they did that. I said, thanks, have a nice day. Because this is someone I want to be like, I'd be happy if I did that, but I don't need someone telling me that they're gonna, they won't expect 100% because that's not the way these things work. And you will be in for a rude awakening if that's what you tell the patients. So transplants, they do, they work really well if they're done for the right reason and you get a, you know, you get a successful patient. So here's an intact meniscus. This is a meniscus with a cutout. You can see that like sort of pressure marker. And here's a meniscus transplanted. So you can see, not perfect, but we got the we have the spread of stresses along the medial side of the knee um, much more improved than without a meniscus. This is why they work and reduce your chances of arthritis and decrease your pain from that constant pounding of the two bones together. So similar to cartilage, MRI match the patients, match all the stuff up with the notes, submit to insurance, again, graph company for a match. The nice thing is, you know, I look at this is the numbers I get. Again, this is from one of my patients. And then you schedule them for surgery. You don't have to worry about as much of the 28 day window. Index scope's really important, okay? And there's a lot of people that do not do this who even do a number of transplants. It's really important to do this. I learned this at Rush and I, I will, it literally has saved me so many times. Every person needs a scope before they get this surgery. If you know a patient's getting a transplant and never gotten a scope, it's a big, big deal and it will be missed. There'll be a problem. Not every time, but it'll be really hosed and it's not good. I've seen a few patients in the community that had something done, no scope beforehand and had to have some bailout surgery in the middle of it. It doesn't look good. Avoid the bail during surgery. I just saw a patient actually uh, last week, failed meniscus transplant. They told them when they went in there, they said, oh, well, the cartilage didn't look good. We probably should have transplanted that. That doesn't look very good when you tell that to a patient after they just went through a whole meniscus transplant and it failed. And I've got one of these every month I could tell you about. Um, again, you want this for insurance approval. You wanna show them that cartilage defects so the insurance pays for it. These are really expensive for the insurance company uh, in terms of the graphs. So it's important for the insurance company to see though, to really understand why you're doing this. Many times we find other things. So a meniscus usually is not isolated. There's a cartilage thing involved with it as well. So you wanna make sure you have that so you can prepare the patient say you need to do both of these at the same time. A lack of scope leads to unexpected problems. You're probably okay in 80% of patients, but those 20% are total disasters. So we do not want to have those. It's so simple to scope somebody and then come back and talk to them. I always do a scope and then I call the patient the next day and I go over everything with them because then they can actually understand what they actually need to get done. And about 20, 30% of the time, I'm telling them that the surgery changed. I need to add one other thing. Again, that same slide, but for meniscus, this is the indications, contraindications that I mentioned to you and the surgical techniques. I do both the bone bridge and the bone plugs. Data shows the if you have bone involved, they do much better. These are more technically challenging and I do both of them because there are certain indications for each one. And again, the, uh, here are the outcomes. I will not go show you both techniques because it's just a little bit of time. We're gonna uh, run out of time and I wanna have time for questions, but I'll show you, I have videos for both of them and you can see on my website, but I will go through the slot technique. So this is me, this is a cadaver in this one. The other one's a live patient. Um, so here, a lot of meniscus. Now you're gonna see it. You pretend like the meniscus is gone because it's a cadaver. Um, we cut the, the rest of the meniscus out. This is unarthroscopically. And then we're gonna make this little notch so I can see in the back. 
okay? Because you got to make sure you're doing that. You got to be able to see in the back of the knee. Then you're going to shave the rest of it out. So you're going to remove anything left. You leave one to two millimeters of capsule there. And then I'm going to use my shaver to start making the trough as sort of a guide. This is very stressful procedure if you, if when you're first doing these, because it's obviously you're going to go, you're putting a pin that goes right in the back of the knee and you could have a problem if you don't know how you're doing, what you're doing. This is the graft getting prepared. This is a dovetail technique. So it slides in. And that's a, that's a transplanted meniscus. And this is the guide system we use to sort of prepare the graft. And this will match exactly the trough that I'm going to make. So you slide it in, you don't actually need to fix it in most cases. So we're gonna put a stitch in there so we can pass it through the knee. And then I've, 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 I've burred that down and then we have our guide. We place our two pins in the knee. This is where you tap the back wall. This is the most stressful part of the whole procedure. Usually I stop breathing for a few seconds to make sure that this is, good, this is done properly. And then we're gonna drill right there. We do a second drill. And then we're gonna do this, this rasp. We mallet in back and forth. And it seems like this is humongous, but it's actually only about five millimeters. And you really have to be that aggressive to get this cleaned up nicely. This little passing device I use, you can see tons of things I'm doing. And if you're not coordinated, this takes about an hour and a half or so. And that's, you know, that's a pretty good number to be at. But I've heard of ones that have taken eight or nine hours. So this is something you got to be like, this is, requires practice and you have to have a huge team. I mean, I have, a P, I have usually two PAs for this. I have a good surgical tech and then I have the rep in the room. So this is not a, this is not a first time surgery. I passed one piece of the meniscus through the back of the knee. And you can see here, I'm going to try to line it up nicely. There's a slot already made. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And you'll see eventually we get it. And then one, I'm going to get it in there. Move around and boom, it slides right in. And then I flip it. And then you're gonna be, you're gonna get in there and you're gonna see, oh my God, the meniscus isn't in the right spot. And this is where if you're, when you first start doing these, you start panicking and you're like, uh-oh. So you gotta take a break and just be like, you can do this. You pop it back in. And it's pretty gnarly. It's the first couple of times you do this, it's stressful, but it's super fun. And then you're gonna fix the meniscus. This is a little device that we use to fix the back part. And then the rest of it, you'll be fixing by catching needles on the outside. So again, this is a cadaver uh, in this, this situation, but it's the exact same thing in a live surgery. And there you go. So we'll tie those down and that's it. I won't go into the bone plug technique. I have one here, um, but I want to show you this is pretty cool. So 47 year old, meniscus transplant, good alignment, came in, we had to do something else with the same knee. So I'm like, let me scope your knee and see what it looks like. So this is not a 22 year old. I had one of my techs come in and ask him what he thought I was doing. He's like, why, you why does that meniscus look so good? I'm like, that's actually a transplant. He's like, no way. So this is a meniscus transplant. This is not their real meniscus. They had, I took the whole thing transplanted. So that's pretty cool. You don't get to see too many of those. That was awesome. Anyhow, um, so meniscus transplants are symptomatic patients less than 50. So 50 is usually the cutoff that we use. So three and a half year follow-up, mean age 30 years old, usually cryopreserved, 89% improved, 77% pain-free with low impact. So again, you can do higher impact, but generally lower impact. I do let people go back to running if they've ran before. Um, and that's it. This is next one. So this is looking at older than 50, under 50. And this is when you get a, this one article gets people a little bit sort of like, what are you, where are you going with this type of thing? But I think it's interesting. These are Italians, so they push the envelope. And in Europe, they can do way more things than we can here in the United States. So 26%, 26 meniscus transplants over 50, 26 meniscus transplants under 50. Now they used all soft tissue, which is different than what we do here. 77.3 7 year follow-up, significantly improved both of them. But you can see here on the right-hand side, the Y is the young group, they had much more, many more patients that did well compared to the older group. So the survival was about the same, but 31% failures in the older group and 15% in the younger. So again, they say that you have significantly better results if you're under 50 and you do one of these, but it's not, it's not crazy to think about somebody who's 52, 54, 55, if they've got good cartilage. Now, it's a lot harder to get insurance authorization, but I would at least think about it. So does age have an adverse effect? Okay, you just told me 50 uh, is okay if you do about 50. Well, here they put an age couple of 43. That's a Kaplan-Meier score at the, uh, on the right side. Now you have to understand this. 
No difference in older and younger patients if you took out cartilage defects. So obviously as you age, the odds of getting a cartilage defect are much higher. But if you have a patient that looks fantastic, like that 47 year old I showed you with no cartilage defect, and you have a 23 year old with no cartilage defect, the data shows they do, they do pretty well, both of them. Um, and again, if good cartilage in alignment with more, well, more recent meniscectomy, consider no matter what the age. And that's really important to understand. Now I still use the 50 cutoff because obviously insurance can be much more challenging. I've probably seen one person, maybe two that are above 50 that may meet, meet the criteria, but generally that's, that's less common. Um, return to high level sports after a meniscus transplant. This is 13 patients again from Cole, 19 years old. So these are young patients, 3.3 years, a mix of professional, varsity, college, 77% return to sport. That's pretty cool. So that's good. Now, 23% required another surgery. Usually it's a meniscus tear. So they tear the graft because it's acellular and they have to get a cleanup of it. Um, conclusion, in high-level athletes, they can return to patients to higher-level sports. So not everybody has to be restricted, okay? And this is not a restricting surgery. I tend to have very little restrictions after my transplants if they do well. 24 studies included. Usually people restrict these if, they're, if they just don't feel comfortable with the meniscus and, and transplants in general. They don't see enough of them because they're always worried my transplant's gonna fail, I don't want it to fail. Um, but really there's a lot of data if the patient's in good shape that you can actually let them go and do what they wanna do. So no evidence meniscus transplant needed meniscectomy to prevent OA. So you don't need to do a meniscus transplant just because someone has no meniscus. But if they have symptoms, then that's when it's important. Their successful outcomes at seven to 14 years of follow-up, failure rate was 10 to 29%, pretty high level of return to sport. Again. 89 patients, 35 years old, 4.2 years. Again, you're gonna hear this again, 74% return to sport, 49% return at the same level, 12% underwent new surgery. And here's this, here's the different sports that these people played. So this is, you know, that this is the average Seattle, like every one of my Seattle patients would click all of these. So it's important to have that information, especially in the area that we live in. These are young patients. So patients have open physis still. Usually these are discoid meniscus patients. That's why it's a lateral slot. Um, and this is a, this is a very uncommon to have this many patients. He's the guy that gets people flown in from all over the place. That's why he has this many, but 37 patients, 15 years old. That's crazy. I know 11 of 15 had open physis. You can see here, open physis right here, usually discoid. Like I said, they do really well and no revisions surgery. So this is not crazy to do this in a young patient. You just got to have a lot of discussion with the family. hundred patients, 31 years old, 4.9 years of follow-up. Again, medial femoral condyle greater than lateral femoral condyle, which is really common. Most of mine are medial. Um, no difference in failure rate or reoperation rates. And this is patients who have had just a transplant or a transplant in a meniscus. So, like I said before, if you do everything right, if you do a miss, if you fix the missing meniscus and the cartilage defect, it's the same as fixing just the cartilage with a good meniscus. You have to return them to everything that's normal in their knee, or one thing will fail. Two groups, again meniscus transplants with no defects or meniscus transplants with defects of their femur and their tibia. So here's a distinction we'll make. No difference in failure rates, reoperations rates. As long as the defect's on the femur and is treated with the transplant at the same time, there are similar results to just transplants. Now, the problem is when the tibia is affected, there's a much different rate of success. And that was kind of like, that went in more deep in, uh, deeply in this paper. So, this is what scares my patients all the time. I literally could have a whole conversation in the office with the patient about this. And as soon as I tell them that I'm gonna break their bone and realign it, they freak out. So this is why it's important. Again, and we're almost done. This is sort of the second to last slide. Uh, HGO of mistransplant is better than in either in, in isolation. So you really wanna correct them. And here's what happens. If someone is bent like this, sorry, it's on the screen, and they go in and get a transplant, there's so much load you can see here on the meniscus at three to six degrees of varus, that really we start we started correcting people like the other way. So they're almost knock kneed. Uh, and you really can take a ton of load off their meniscus. I tell patients, this is the most important part of the procedure I'm gonna do. I, the transplant's not as important. The meniscus is not as important. This is the most important. If I can realign them, in some patients, I just do this and they're fine. Patients 45 with major arthritis or just on the inside of their knee, you realign them. You can help them, you can help them get back to everything they wanna do and avoid even a knee replacement. So this is a really important thing to understand. Now again, complications. Most common complication here you can see is a tear of the meniscus. And this usually requires a cleanup. In some cases, it's just a small amount and you can save the meniscus. 
Again, there is that failure rate. 8.7% of patients eventually need a total knee replacement or a revision meniscus transplant. So here you go. And again, 200 patients, 32% reoperation rate. That's what I tell patients. Okay, most of them were debridements of either cartilage or meniscus. Um, and here's revisions. Okay, I've done a few of these, not common. I got that one guy I'm gonna have to do now. I just told you about um, 11 patients, follow up four years. They do well. If done the right way, they do well. You just have to make sure that you check everything else. Like why did it fail? Uh, and no progression of OA. So conclusion, biologics can be in, used individually or in conjunction with the surgical procedure. The best data is on PRP. Stem cells have less data, but hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do those more. And obviously they have to be become more cost efficient. Cartilage preservation has been very successful in the right indications. It has high longevity and high return to sport, especially for a patient population that used to be extremely active and now cannot do what they want to do. Meniscus transplant in the right patient has good success. Again, high return to sport, good 10 to 15 year longevity. That's it.